Welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast for place to hang your cape. And this week, things are getting a little bit twisted. <laughs> We're talking about T Pop and Neil Gibson. Cue the music! Hello there, capers, and as I said, welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast for place to hang your cape. My name is Scott James Meridew, and this is the show where I talk about various geek and nerd-related topics, and I'm joined each week by a very special different guest. Now, we have actually mentioned today's guest several times before. We used to plug this little webinar we were doing with this thing called Tea Pub. We never actually talked about it that much on the show, but now that time has come. The Tea Pub chicken has come home to roost. Give it up, capers, for Neil Gibson. Hello. How are you, Neil? I'm very good, thanks. You have a lot of energy. It's uh, quite intimidating. Yeah, 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 yeah. I try to... I'm very up, up. I'm very an up person. And I find that also helps because it means I can flow my energy through the mic down into your ear and it goes into your brain and it infects you and you become energized as well. That, that sounds a bit creepy, but still, that's how I imagine it. <laughs> it was, did sound a bit creepy. But anyway, you are I'm, no stranger. You. you are no stranger to creepiness, Neil. No, but it's different when you're writing and making stuff up in your head as opposed to actually being creepy in real life. That that is true. That is true. That this is this is why I don't have many friends. Oh God, it's starting to realise it now. But uh, now we have actually met a few times before. We met uh, the other day at Glasgow MCM Comic Con, and we met at uh, it was it was Leamington Spa Comic Con. Yes, yes, yes. It was good to see you again. It was very good to see you too, and uh, you have been a very good friend inside the place of Tango Capers. Uh, reviewed a lot of your stuff, and I have to be honest, my admittedly, my admittedly shallow toe dip into the waters of Tea Pub have been a very rewarding experience. The, the little I've seen of your stuff is uniformly brilliant. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, we're, we're proud of what we do. You, you should be proud. You should be proud. Uh, when I was at uh, MCM Glasgow, I got to read a little bit of Twisted Dark, which I never read before. And I read, uh, well, a little, a little story about a little girl that uh, freaked me out. F freaked me out a lot, Neil. <laughs> I, I had nightmares. Uh, that, that would have been uh, a story about Amy. Yes, she's uh, it's one of my favourite characters to write, actually. She is pure evil. Mm. We'll get on to her in a minute, though. Before we do that... We need to talk about you. Tell us who you are. What do you do? What is your reason for being? What is your grand place in the infinite cosmos that we call existence? Uh, my name's Neil. I'm a comic book writer, a publisher. Um, I, I never actually wanted to write comics. That was never a goal of mine. I just love the medium. I actually really, really like it. I'm a big fan. I've got, it's just turning around right now. I can see my shelf. I've got hundreds of comics trades on the walls there. Um, and uh, I was just a few years ago, I was stuck in a project in the Middle East, had some free time. I thought I'd try writing a comic and uh, people really seemed to like it. And so I carried on making them. Um, the comic went to number one on the charts on Amazon Kindle. So I thought, you know what? I think I might have something here. So I got That's my a pretty good comics. clue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you seem to like them. So, um, yeah. yeah. So I, I just sort of, what I discovered is that, um, I think I'm a good writer of comics. I have a lot of fans who really like my stuff, but what I think I'm world class at is producing comics, and that's editing other people's work and pushing them to be better at what they what they what they do. And I love it because I get to read great material and know I'm helping making it better. And I'm getting and so I'm I'm contributing, helping other people, and um, making a great product and getting to read stuff as I'm working. So I, I love it. And this was what led to Tea Pub, is it not? It is, yes. So we produce my work and other people's that I edit and produce. Yeah, so let's, let's talk about T-Pub. How did that exactly did that come about? What was the moment you realised, you know what, I think we might actually have something here, or the moment we thought, here's an idea of what I can do? Well, I, I guess originally I um, was approaching other publishers and there was some interest, but I looked at what the, how their, the deals were structured and I thought it was a bit exploitative. And I thought... Um, hmm. Uh, I could create my own company of my previous experience and do things that way. And the advantage of doing this is I get to have control of um, of production. So there are a lot of uh, musicians, for example, who they want to create great work, but the record label won't produce it as it stands. They need them to change it in a certain way. That doesn't and... fit our key demographic. Could you make it a bit more, you know, suitable for the uh, the tweens out there? Ugh. 
That's how uh, I imagine every music executive sounds like. Yeah. I, oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought you were talking to me about how I can explain user-friendly manner. I didn't get you. Okay. Yes. Um, Oh, yeah, or just film producers. There's so, so many films that get made that you think are just rubbish. You think, how does this get greenlit? And some great scripts that don't get made. And when you control the production process, you can decide what scripts are great and get them made. So you're like image comics if it turned out actually better. <laughs> I wouldn't quite go that far. Um, model is different from image. Uh, I, I do say this. If you think you're absolutely uh, an unrealized genius at making comics and you've already made your comic and just need a publisher... We're not the right ones for you. T-Pub is not right for you. You should try and go for image. If you think that you're good but want to get better, if you want some feedback uh, that, uh, and to tweak your stuff to make it as good as it can be, then we're the publishing company for you. Because no we place work... for auteurs. Um, it's not there's no place for them. It's just they don't need us. And they'd get a better deal if they went with image. Because we invest time and money into making your stuff better. And so we require a different cut than image would take. No, absolutely. I think that that's a really interesting take on it because, I mean, there are so many people out there that I think have what it takes but need help and they need not just an opportunity but someone to actually give them a good environment in which to create it. Because it's one thing just to create a comic, it's another thing to create a comic in its specific uh, atmosphere with the right support structure. Oh, ex exactly. And we have a team of people here and it's and it's not just the making the comic because it's also the the marketing and distribution. Like, for example, I suck at social media. I, I'm rubbish. If I was better at social media, media would be a much bigger company. But I have um, some team of volunteers and, uh, and my head of marketing who are good at this stuff and they do it instead of me. So you may be bad at running Kickstarter. So we have a, a dedicated team to making Kickstarters for you. So when you make a comic, we'll also help you kickstart it. So you get your, your, um, your initial investment back faster. Yeah, so it's, it's great. So you're, not, so you're sort of like a beginning to end process of, again, support and getting stuff out there and helping people to create good work. Yes, that's, yeah, it's, it's our mission to get more people reading and creating comics. Um, even if we do work with schools as well, because I genuinely believe in the comic book medium as a gateway to reading normal books. And also, if you look at this, um, statistics in the US, uh, regardless of socioeconomic background, uh, children who read comics do better in literacy exams and non-comic book readers and in normal exams across the board. Yeah, because I, th I think you re I read on your website uh, your the, the T Pub's philosophy is that mediums are great things for expression, and there's, there's nothing wrong with any one particular medium. It's a philosophy I've expressed as well. And if you can just support something, no matter what medium it's in, that can lead to other great things in other mediums and just and within the medium itself. Yeah. So you actually done your homework. You read our website. Good yeah. man. Of, of course. What do you think? That this was just some ramshackle put together fly by the senior pants podcast? No, sir. We're just like one step below that. Like barely professional, barely professional. But we manage, we manage. As you, because you have created under the Deep banner quite a lot of comics. Oh, we've got a lot more coming out now. Uh, next year or so, we should see probably five, six, seven new titles coming out. Oh, oh, mama. Oh, God. So we've got a lot to talk about then. God, I think we should start, though, with possibly the big one. The big kahuna, Twisted Dark. What would you like to know? Well, what is Twisted Dark for the capers at home? Tell us, what is Twisted Dark? What's it? What, what, what makes it so twisted? What makes it so dark? What is it all about? OK, well, I, I don't think it's that twisted and dark necessarily, even though that's the title. Because um, I have another series that's, hmm... It's hiding in my drawer called Twisted Darker. Um, and that's the, the really twisted dark stuff that I wouldn't necessarily myself. So and some people are asking me for it. People who like the really dark stuff want that. I'm just a bit hesitant because I'm not sure I'd enjoy it. Um, but what Twisted Dark is, is it's a series of, of short stories. They're all, they normally have twist endings, but they're all twisted in nature, certainly. And they're all quite dark. So if you think of Black Mirror or some Stephen King or Tales Unexpected or The Twilight Zone, it's that kind of, uh, of thing. Only unlike those, they're not just connected. Like, so Black Mirror has no connection. The story is totally unconnected. Every story in the Twisted Dark universe is connected to each other. But not just that, they also affect each other. So the entire Twisted Dark is actually one giant story building towards one ending. Oh, so it's, it's, it's less like an anthology series and more like, uh, I guess the best comparison I can make to it is like to the mask comic book, where the actual mask thing would transfer from person to person. They would all be sort of 
one big connected st- story following this one thing was a bit similar to that but more connected and because that's just one theme so uh, like for example you can have a theme where all these stories take place on one street um or tales of the crypt from the crypt had uh, the crypt master introducing each story so that was how it connected together ours actually the stories it's not the characters not only meet each other they affect each other's lives and it's all building towards the very last story which has been written Ooh. So, so it's like a domino con- effect yep yeah, well pretty much I mean, my, the concept is if you have five minutes free you can read one short story it should be self-contained and enjoyable and you're, you're, you're good to go if you have an hour you start reading an entire volume you start seeing the same characters reappearing if you have several hours and you read through several volumes you realize you you see all the massive connections building towards one ending and because of that when you reread it you get more from it each time because my favorite comics are the ones i've reread four five six times so what you've done is you created a comic that rewards you for reading more of it and reading it repeatedly yes that is brilliant thank you <laughs> I, I, yeah, because I mean, there's so many stories out there that you read them. They're nice to read once, maybe twice, and then you're done with them. And but there's never really an incentive to read on. And maybe you do read on, but then it becomes part of a much larger story. Or you read a story that's a very small part of a much larger story, and you feel the need to keep on reading. But it's just like, oh, I can't really enjoy this one thing because, well, I gotta read the rest of them. So you don't. What you've done is you created a comic that can be enjoyed no matter what your mood is, no matter how much you want to commit to it. You can certainly enjoy it no matter how much you want to commit to it. And that's, that's important because we've actually, uh, we built a prototype app and uh, we're uh, in development of the, the, the full app. And I want this to be the, the commute killer. So you can read um, a, a story in print order, or you click a button, it changes it so all the stories are uh, rearranged chronological order. Or you can just go, this character I like, click all the stories featuring just that character or just the highest rated stories, or you can even uh, filter it by time. So I've only got five minutes before my train arrives, I'll read a very short story. I've got half an hour, I want to read a long story. Okay, this is like innovation at its best. I love this. Well, good, I'm glad to hear. God, and this is coming from someone who doesn't really like the dark stories and the creeping sto- creepy stories. Except I read Amy, it was uh, the story about Amy in the comic. And um, we What's going... your honest opinion on it? Honest. Honest, honest opinion. Here's the thing. I don't like horror. I've said that many times. I've reviewed horror stuff on this uh, show before. And uh, when it's good, I got to will acknowledge that. But it's never going to be a genre I'm never going to get into. But I know, I know when a horror story is good, when I can't stop turning the page. When I can't stop watching the movie. Because I want to know how it go- keeps on going. And when the characters... Because that's the thing. The Amy story was... It was one of those things where I was like, oh, I don't know what's going to happen. Oh, I don't like this. But I couldn't stop because it's just so damn absorbing. When a story that you don't really like forces you to continue watching it, not out of some sort of weird exploitative, like The Room or Birdemic sort of, oh, how bad is this going to get sort of thing, but out of a genuine interest to see how the story develops, even if it's a story that you know deep down you don't really like. It's it, That just shows how well it's crafted because that's the it's let me put it this way i'm not a big fan of creme brulee as dessert i think it's so so but i know i've had in the past creme brulees that are so damn good because so much care and attention has been put into them that i finished them all it's just like this is not something i would ever choose but it is something i have enjoyed excellent does that make sense it makes sense yes Good, good, because I was worried that analogy was going to get sort of lost in the middle of there. I was <laughs> making them as I went along. Because, I mean, it's very easy when you're a comic reader or a movie goer or whatever to always pick the safe option. I will never go to the cinema and purposefully, on purpose, watch a horror movie. I'd only do it if uh, someone w- I was going with someone who really wanted to see it or I had to review it because of the benevolent ap2hyc overlords commanded me to do so and it's it's it, but if if you if i enjoy the experience it doesn't really matter because good movies and good comic books and good stories transcend personal taste uh, it's funny you mention that, that about horror films though because i hate horror films too really i never watched them no. stephen king famously he hates horror films he can't watch them he gets too scared that's that's so weird. It's it's I think it's just something about the human condition. 
about the uh, the way we tell stories, about the stories we want to tell. And because, I, I mean, I, I don't think I would ever write a horror story, but I know if I really thought about it, I could come up with some ideas. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And also, I, th I think that cause that's the thing, so you really speak to that part of the human brain with the Twisted Dark Challenge. Oh, yes, the challenge. That's fun. Um, I guess you want me to tell, you, tell people what the challenge is? I think we'd appreciate it, yes. Okay, right. So, yeah, we do this at conventions. Um, uh, and actually, at, at Glasgow, we had a much we had a 90% failure rate. Normally, it's about 80%. And the challenge is to read the first two stories of Twisted Dark and then try and stop reading. Try and not carry on. Try and tell us you don't want the book. It, 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 as like marketing gimmicks go it's pretty awesome because a it works and b it, sh it it's like a challenge to for the reader to say is this good or not can i figure this out for myself is this something i would want to and as the failure rate shows yeah yeah it is because ah uh, it's 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 because you have the board you have the board of the con showing all the people that are taking the challenge and the amount of strikes in the yeah you pass the challenge is uh pretty 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 pretty, pretty minor yeah i mean, i think we had i think it was uh, the whole convention i think seven or eight people passed the challenge I, I don't even know how many people failed it and um it, it's funny you get some people who don't want to admit they failed it just because they want to pass the challenge and then you dangle the well. If you, you know, if you admit you fail it, I'll actually give you some free bonus stories to read. And they go, ah, okay, fine, I failed. <laughs> it, it's it's brilliant. It, it it works. It works, and it also it it just makes for much more fun experience. Because you know when you're at a yeah booth at a comic con, you see a comic, you think you might like it, but you don't know, but you don't want to bother the person who's selling it, and you're offering opp opportunity to get invested. I guess so. It, it was just a. It was just based on experience. Because people, it's hard people to. There's, there's so much competition out there, hmm. and this was a way to get to get people to try reading it. And because we're short story based, you don't have to read the whole thing. So you can just read two stories and just see if you like it or not. And the response is normally so positive from that. That's well, that's, that's how the challenge came about, and it's it's working well for us. Yeah, I, I'd say it's working well. For I mean, you. We're going to do the same thing with Twisted Sci-Fi, actually. Because hmm, that's that, out soon. Yes, yeah, so well, I think that's now is a good point to talk about because you've also got this other thing called. Twisted Light and Twisted Sci-Fi that's coming out soon. So let's talk about those. What's Twisted Light first? It's the exact opposite of Twisted Dark. It's all the stories are are twisted in nature. Not most of them are twist endings, and uh, they they leave you laughing. Lovely, lovely. Because that it, it, I mean, it's so it's easy to offer up the macabre and the dark and the desperate, but it's also nice to show the other side of that coin. It's it's rare that people do that. I, I want people to be because I, as I said before, I love comics, and the thing is, people have different tastes. Like yourself, you don't like horror, so for people who don't like horror, what else do we have? That's why we're having the sci-fi. We actually have twisted fantasy coming out. We have superhero stuff. We've got action. This should be something for everyone, um, because there are, there are a lot of people I may say they don't read books, and I think that's a shame because there's so many great books out there. And maybe the books they've read they haven't enjoyed, but I guarantee there is one book out there which they, if they read it, they would love it. It's the same with people who don't watch films or play video games. There is one game out there that's perfect for you. And it's when people it's, come it's, to our it's, it gets back to what we're saying. It's, it's a medium. It's a me mediums cannot be good or bad. They can contain things that are good or bad and subject to personal taste. But there is something. You know what? You know what? There's probably a sport out there that I might like. I don't think it's been invented yet, but I'm sure it's out there. Maybe it's Quidditch. Who knows? Someone invented flying, flying broom for me. We'll see. But it, 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 it's out there. And, you know, we, human beings, they, they can enjoy so many different things. I think we owe it to ourselves to find things that we enjoy and it helps. So you're saying you don't like any sport? None at all. I mean, I come from a very sporty family and uh, I was the one who, while people in you know, my family were uh, in the living room watching the football and shouting at the television, I was up in my room reading all my books. So may I ask a question? Have you ever tried any martial arts? I, when I was uh, very young, I think my parents got me some like karate lessons. I did not enjoy it because it's just like, punch out turn around and twist the then 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 that's it and just... have you ever tried uh um dancing like uh, latin american or ballroom oh uh, well now you see um problem is when i do karate i'm not at all deadly when i dance i am in fact very deadly i'm <laughs> to give people concussions 
<laughs> All right. Okay, I'll stop. I'll stop trying because I do believe there is a sport out there for you. I was trying to narrow it down. Maybe not the best to do it on a podcast. And uh, I think with that last comment you've won, so we can move on. <laughs> do you want to give me something? I do actually kind of like skiing. I don't know if you count that as a sport. It is a sport. There you go. Mm. I suppose it's in the Olympics. Uh, you know, yeah, it is a sport. There you go. Ha! I do a sport. Are oh, you proud of me now, Dad? <laughs> yes, yes, he is. And so, uh, Twisted Sci-Fi, I'm guessing that follows a similar vein, sort of twist stories, but obviously with the sci-fi genre. Yeah, and I learned from Twisted Dark, so the stories are a lot more tightly connected right from the start. You see the connections that this is heading somewhere right from the get-go. Hmm. And I love subverting expectations, let's put it that way. Well, uh, there are twist stories, so the endings... You, Hopefully, won't see coming. You'll you'll guess a few of them, but normally you, you, it should it should hopefully serve expectations. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the the main that I won't tell you the, there are three main plot lines. But I'll tell you two of them. One is about an astro archaeologist because in the future humans get fast and light travel, and they can they find lots of dead alien civilizations, not a single living one. Oh. And the uh, so this this character name is Linda. Her job is to find these dead civilizations and find out why they collapsed. So Earth can avoid the same fate. I see. That's, that's, I think. I think. I think now, right now, is the perfect time to bring out twisted sci-fi because there's so many different uh, things coming out right now that are exploring the full depth of sci-fi, like Black Mirror and uh, the Orville more recently, and I guess to a certain extent, uh, uh, Star Trek Discovery. And Star Trek was doing that for a long while, and I really do like it. And oh, Rick and Morty, even better, better for example, is truly explore these concepts. And because, I mean, we've seen uh, things like Mass Effect, the idea of dead alien civilizations, but never, it's never explored to any, I think for me at least, reasonable depth. So that sounds intriguing. I am intrigued. Good, good. And the second um, uh, plot line is to the time travelers, um, because there's uh, a group of time travelers, uh, when the agency, and the math behind it is not what you'd expect. If you do something in history, um, 150 years later, it's almost as if you hadn't done it. it the, the timeline reverts. If you go and change something, it makes almost no difference in the long-term scheme of things, which doesn't mathematically make sense. You think with the chaos theory, it go all over the place, but it, it doesn't actually work out that way. And so their job is to, if the changes aren't that much anyway, to go back and make small changes to reduce human suffering. Okay. See, I get that. That's annoyingly fascinating because we see so many stories about time travel and people do one small thing. It's like, oh, I accidentally bumped into one person in the street. Oh, no, I created Mega Hitler. And it, and you just took took in that and put it on its side. And, oh, that's so cool. Uh, you, know, I, you know, I like doing podcasts with you. You seem to inflate my ego. It's great. Yes, we do cool stuff here. Well, this is the, this is the here's the thing. My person, again, my another, and I have several personal philosophies. My, my one is exalt the things I like. When I sa hear something that sounds cool, I, I I want to express as such. And when I hear something that I don't like the look of, Titans trailer, I want to say how much it sucks. Fuck Batman. Ugh. We won't go into that. We won't go into that. Oh, dear sweet. Lord, we won't go into that. One thing we'll go into it. I haven't read a. But did, sorry, so did you did you see the Dark Knight though? I did see the Dark Knight. Yes. You didn't like it. I actually had this conversation as well a couple of. Uh, I respect the Dark Knight. Christopher Nolan is, I think, one of the best uh, directors working right now in Hollywood. I think he's great. I respect the hell out of that movie. I love the direction. I love the acting in it. There are a few things I'm not sure I really like, but uh, I, I will admit that it, what it, for what it is and what it does, it works very well, and the characters work so well with each other, and thematically, it's really interesting. And I completely understand why someone would say they really love it, and it's a really good movie. I am not saying it's a bad movie. I'm just saying it's not something that really I personally like, but that's okay because not everything does. And I, out of all the DC movies, I'd say that's the one I could criticize the least. But thankfully, thankfully, DC are very obliging in giving me a whole host of other shit films so, that so I can. So, in, in answer my question, the answer is no. Okay, there's nothing wrong with the Dark Knight. Fine, yes, you, you twist my arm behind the back and weasel the truth okay. out of me. Yes, the Dark Knight is fine. Are you happy now? Are you well, happy well, now? I I, I love The Dark Knight, and I, I I really did not like The Dark Knight Rises. I thought it was an awful film. 
<laughs> yes, the same. So that movie, I can I can have a go at it. How the fuck did he get back to Gotham with no money and no equipment? Did he uh, hitchhike? I, there's so many plot holes, it's ridiculous. It's funny because he comes out of a literal hole where he learns a lot about the plot. Oh, <laughs> God. Oh, we, 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 we have to move on for the fucking Batman, otherwise we'll be here Sorry, all... Sorry, okay, yep, 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 let's go on, let's move on. One thing I do want to talk about that I actually do like, and something that I have actually read off of T-Pub, probably the only thing I actually had a chance to read off of T-Pub, uh, aside from one or two others, is uh, Tabitha. Okay, that's my, that's my first graphic novel. I really enjoyed it. Oh, I'm glad. It... it uh, we won't go too heavy to spoiler territory because I want people to read this. Uh, it's, it's, it's four issues, isn't it? Four issues. Uh, I think so. Yes. It's, yeah. Yeah. And it's um, well, it's about a small group of people. Of very, I will say this. It, I have never. Well, I, I, actually, no. I take the back. This is with this comic. Uh, the character, the four main characters, minus the antagonist and someone else who we won't mention. Uh, I've never really gelled to uh, four sets of characters that I've been introduced to as quickly as I have these four. That I really start taking immediate liking to them as and when they were introduced. There have been other ones that have become uh, close and probably even the same, if I'm being honest. But I really started to like these characters. I think the way you wrote them, the way they're presented, uh, just really made me like, oh, I like these guys. They're fun. They play off well of each other. They come across really well as individuals. And they, they just seem, again, it's this whole absorbing thing, this really engaging thing. And that's something saying something, considering the fact that they do some bad things. Basically, one of them is a mailman in Los Angeles. And he, uh, he uses his job as a mailman for, to plan routes for him and three other people to rob houses. And, oh, oh, it turns mm. out they robbed one of the wrong houses. Oh, no, we won't go further than that. But despite the fact that they're basically robbers and they're using their, a position of trust to take people's things, they really they seem really interesting people and really I, I enjoyed my time with them and you find out why they're doing it and there's greater reason for it. But it's it's one of those things where it's just like, you know what, I am enjoying myself with these characters. And sometimes you read stories where you enjoy the plot, but you don't really like the characters or the things they say or the things they do or the way it's written. And that wasn't the case here. It was just like, you know what, I know no matter what happens in the story, no matter what, no matter what creepy shit happens, I am going to have fun with these people. Adventure ho! The interesting thing for me, though, is you say you don't like horror, and that's that's horror. That's comedy horror. Yeah, again, it's a it's a question of just it was good writing. It was, I, 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 I don't know. It's I think I think I'm I like it when it really gets into this whole. I guess again the humanity of it all. The humanity. I don't like it when it's just like ooh, rip, gore, blood, murder, psycho, stab, stab, Michael Myers, jump scare, bullshit. I actually I think that's the main thing. I don't like really really tense scenarios. I think that's probably what I really don't like. I don't like, don't like tension because, you know, I've, I've talked about on the show before, I went to see The Woman in Black on in on the theatre and that's a really, really tense play and it's really, really scary and so when something jumps out at you, it's just like, oh shit, why? And I really, really don't like that and you don't really get that with a comic because it, uh, pacing wise well, that's really, it, that is sort of, sort of up to the way you write it and the way it's laid out, but it's also, the pacing is sort of done at the speed the reader reads, it's almost, so I can go with it at a leisurely place or kind of a fast place, and it I don't know, it, it's, it's I think with comics, the way I read it, it's a bit more relaxing for me oh, I, I definitely agree, you, you don't get the jump scares, you have the, the freedom to spend, spend as much time as you like, uh, as you want but you can be guided by, by the amount of words the size of the panels, what's happening in the action mm. and I, I don't know, I if it is, I say it's a comedy, so maybe it's just the lightheartedness of it all, and the fact that I, I, you know, here's the thing: it wasn't exploitative. There is some exploitationy thematic ex adjacent things going on in the story, but it felt like this was a this wasn't a a comic to make you feel bad. Even though this horror, it's a horror comic. It was a comic to make you feel good. I wanted you to have a good time whilst I was reading it. And that's what happened. Oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it's, that. There's no problem. So that was the, so what brought that on? So that was the first one you, you wrote, did you say? Well, the very first thing I ever wrote was Twisted Dark Volume 1. But that was, you know, as you know, it's a complex anthology that's crossed many um, 
volumes, whereas the first standalone graphic novel was Tabitha. I see, okay. And the way I came about is the way I do pretty much uh, half of my stories is I just find an artist I really like and I ask them, what do you want to draw? And, and, so, and, that, and that's, that's what they came up with? No, I came up with the story entirely. Um, but I, So he wants to draw pop culture. He loves that. Uh, the I, I can show you how it's, it's, uh, hmm. So I can't mention the artist's name because he actually wants his name removed from it all. So if you look at the, the book now online, it actually has the name is the artist. I see. Okay. Uh, the reason for that is because some of the, the plot lines, uh, he had a friend who thought it was very offensive, some of the, the plot line bits. I, I did. And uh, he was scared about his career uh, in, in comics and how one bad being associated with something that's... Uh, it could ruin his whole career, so that's why he put it once his name removed. In comics, if you write something offensive, it'll only help your career. I think so, and I think he did a great job. You see, for example, you really enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, there's some there's some transgen jokes in it, but I have really I missed that. Jeez. Well, it's just there's just just one, and there's one fat joke in it, and um, the thing is, my, I have a tra- <laughs> I've, actually I've set, but one transgen friend of mine. This is her favorite comic. I, th- I think it's like, well, the problem is. I think with any sort of medium, whether it be comics or film or TV or whatever, it really, I think I don't like it when people get uh, really annoyed at people saying something when they, it's not, when the movie doesn't make it any clearer that that was a bad thing to say. Because it, it's like when the villain uses a rude swear word or a racial slur or something like that and people say, oh, you can't have that in the movie. And it's like, yeah, but that was the bad guy saying it. We're not meant to like what he said. If Luke Skywalker used the N word, then there, yeah, yeah, I could understand why you would get upset. I would be upset with that. But when Darth Vader does it, it's like, well, yeah, that's the bad guy. He does bad things. And this is the, this is the problem, I think, with uh, just... The, there is a, I, let, me put, let me put it this way. There are people out there that are saying and doing very, very bad things. Comic Skate right now, there are people out there that are using their position as comic writers, comic creators, to spread some very, very nasty, mean spirit, hateful agendas. And then there are people who are writing human beings who are notoriously flawed in the intergalactic community and who, who, who do and say bad things things and that should be presented as bad but it shouldn't be ignored either because that is equally as dangerous when you pretend that human beings don't go around saying and doing horrible things in order to preserve some uber political correctness and don't get me wrong i love political correctness i'm political correct to the utmost of my ass but there has to be a limit to that because otherwise you are ignoring reality and that is dangerous because it means the people who go around doing and saying these things in real life feel like they could have a a free pass to do so because no one's calling them out for it and no one's portraying them as the horrible people they are in the comics or as or even as the human people in the it it's uh, it's, it can be very, very damaging. There is so much media out there that is so afraid of offending anyone because uh, they're worried about losing yeah. audience members. But also, because this has a double edge. And I, I understand that. I understand that people don't want to offend anyone. And that's a noble goal. But sometimes when you offend people, you and you really learn something by people's reaction to it. We've, we've all heard people, you know, who listen to a really offensive joke and laughed. And then when they hear something other that's really offensive that's said sincerely and emphatically and they laugh at that as well or they agree with it. And you realize, wait a minute, I just thought you were laughing at a joke. You actually believe this stuff and you can really learn about people or what, even better, you might learn something about yourself. You might learn about, wait. Is this who I really am? Is that what I really want to present myself and how I really want to think? And it's when... That's what's great about comics and movies and TV shows. They can really make us examine ourselves as human beings. They can really make us think about what we are doing. And we can, we should never be afraid of saying and doing things that make us think. And that's, that's, that's my time on the soapbox. I hope you all enjoy. <laughs> Tip your waitresses. <laughs> That was quite a big rant. I thought I was impugnated. That, that was one of the small amounts of rants I've ever done. Believe you me. Oh, I could have gone on for ages more. But I, I think, I just because 
it's it's okay to, it's okay to put offensive things in your comic and stuff as long as you made it clear that it's offensive and not something to be emulated or idolized or there is anything other than something that is well the, the character who said that that thing in my thing uh, dies pretty quickly afterwards i mean <laughs> yeah so yeah yeah there you go there, there you go and but, yeah. but, but anyway what's interesting is that uh, to me is that a lot of times writers are people mistake the views of the characters for the views of the writer and the thing is you have very different characters i remember mike carey once he um he was writing about some guy, middle-aged policeman in Texas, and uh, the character was racist against uh, Muslims. I think I got some hate mail for it, and like, he's, he, it's not me. That was just what I thought that character might be like. Yeah, it's... but people people misunderstand the difference between characters and writers, and writers' intent often. But anyway, we're we're, we're going down into details here. I got, um, I got a whole thing I wanted to say about that, uh, like three billboards in Ebbing, Missouri, that I wanted to talk about. But we can we, that's again, as you say, that's another. We got to talk about something that isn't slightly depressing. Let's talk about some <laughs> of the other things you've done. And I'm only just starting to now realize that a lot of stuff coming out of Tea Pub starts with the letter T. Wow, you've only just realized. I've only, I am remarkably slow on the uptake capers. I Everything comes, like we'd make is, uh, comes out with a T, except for Disposable Legends. Oh, yes. And uh, there's one other thing we'll talk about in a little bit. So let's just go through a couple of them. So theatrics. What's theatrics about? Theatrics is the highest reviewed one we've had so far. It was voted in the top 10 webcomics of the year uh, by Pipe Tune Comics last year. Um, it's about a guy called Rudy Burns. He's the most famous actor on Broadway. And uh, it's the 1920s, and one night he's drunk at a party, he walks home and gets mugged, beaten up, and left for dead, and loses everything because of that one night. He loses his looks, he loses his acting job, he loses his money, his apartment, his girl, everything. But it's what he does next that gets interesting. Oh. Oh, God. oh no, now you maybe want to read it. Oh, no. Oh, God damn it. I'll send you a link to a comp copy. In fact, you can even share it with your readers. How's that sound? Oh, okay, okay, oh, yes. Okay, then. I won't say no to that. You have a deal, sir! <laughs> Capers, if, if you ever need a better incentive, go read T-Pub stuff. Here you go, then. We'll provide that link, and you can read this, and you will be hooked, and you will get all of their stuff, and you will be better for the experience. Oh, God. So, tor- I mean, we won't talk about this too much, because I don't want to give too much with the Capers. So let's talk about uh, Tortured Light. What's Tortured Light? Tortured Life, uh, that's about a guy who gradually gets the ability to see how anyone's going to die. Anyone he looks at, he knows what's going to happen to them. But, but he hates it because he just sees death everywhere. He sees uh, old age, aneurysm, cancer, car crash, um, heart attack. And so he doesn't want to see anybody. He just lives in his own in his flat, plays video games, uh, orders takeaways, and he, you know, puts money under the door so he doesn't have to meet the person that, uh, who delivers it. Oh, my God, he, it's a uh, comic about me! <laughs> Um, but eventually he's so miserable um, that he decides to, to go kill himself. And as, he, as he's about to jump off a bridge, though, he sees a girl and he can't see how she dies. Oh. Everyone else he's looking at around him, he sees the, how they die, but not her. And as he's looking at her in complete confusion, she walks over to him, looks at him and says, Hello, Richard. I think we need to talk. Oh, my God. She's a Highlander! Here we are, born to be kings. She's the princess of the universe. Skip that a reboot. That's a whole other thing. <laughs> now, one, one thing I have uh, seen, I haven't had a chance to read it, but when I saw it, it looked pretty intriguing to be Turncoat. Hmm. Uh, Turncoat, yes. Uh, so that one was written by Ryan O'Sullivan and drawn by the great Plate Klaus. That's about a guy who um, is an assassin. His job is to kill superheroes. Mm-hmm. Um, the only problem is he's uh, rubbish at it. Well, it's, and, I, I know from experience it's kind of hard to kill superheroes. I've been trying to kill Batman for years and he just keeps getting away. <laughs> well, yeah, so he, he has help, help along the way for it. But uh, the problem, what makes matters worse is his ex-wife is brilliant. She keeps stealing his hits. <laughs> oh, God, it's like Mr. and Mrs. Smith, but with superheroes and assassins. If Mrs. Smith was good, Mr. Smith was awful. <laughs> Uh, well, almost like real life Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. But moving on. <laughs> I, I, he's all right. He's OK. She's awesome. Anyway, uh, and one thing that looked looked to me like it was a bit more personal, a bit a bit of a different direction was the world of Chub Chub. Yes, that was never meant to be a comic. That's um, a collection of short, true stories, true life stories about me as a kid. Um, 
and I made that as a gift to my mother. And she found it so funny, she insisted I publish it. And now the whole world knows what an awful kid I was. All kids are awful. We all were awful as kids. It doesn't matter. So is, is it um, so? Is it a bit more light-hearted? Is it a bit more funny, or is it going to dark places? Ooh. No, no dark places. Completely all ages and funny and very relatable to anyone who's had kids or, frankly, who's been a kid and uh, who's who had, you know, had a good family. I mean, I mean, what what I mean by that is a family that laughs at the problems that they had. Ah, I see. That's, so that, that I mean, sounds really nice. Uh, well, some people people have asked me for the second one. I'm, I'm hesitant to make it because the thing is, um, though we do try to provide stuff for everyone, our dark stuff outsells our light stuff fifty to one easily. Mm. That's, that says a lot about people, doesn't it? Oh God. Or, or just my style of uh, writing that I, maybe my my dark stuff is is more compelling than my the light stuff. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. But there's other stuff you were doing. Um... Which is, uh, there's two things I managed to pick up when I was at the uh, con the other day. Uh, and that was the, uh, as long as it's a double sided thing, the theory and mm. Lucky Man. Let's talk about the theory first. So, again, it's, it's one of these things that, where it takes familiar sci fi concepts and uses them in a new and unique way. How much, how much deeper to spoiler territory do you want to go? Well, that was, okay, the theory is the. It's, it's twisted sci-fi essentially. It's, ah. it's the theory Neil Gibson's twisted sci-fi. Uh, so we've already discussed what the concept is for it, and that particular story you would have read would have involved the time traveller because she made sure that guy went to prison. Ooh, so it's easy again. It's all connected. It is indeed. Yes. Everything. I believe in the interconnectedness of all things. I'm a holistic detective, but not like that other guy. Not like the other guy. I'm not the Harry Anvil version, or maybe like the uh, the guy from Green Stephen Mangan version, not the new crap one. Uh, did you read that one? Watch that one? But so gently? Yeah. Um, my head of operations, Linda, absolutely swears by it. She loves the first season. Okay. I, I tried watching the first season. And it's just like, well, this guy seems a very... Uh, so someone who wrote this is clearly a fan of Doctor Who. Elijah Wood's good in it. Give him that. I, I haven't seen it, for which I get chastised uh, a lot. But um, I'll give it a shot. Eventually. There's so many things out there. You can't watch it all. Goodness knows I try and it kills me. Ugh. But one thing I did actually watch, and I was surprised to see the comic was being made out of it, was a Lucky Man. Yeah, so the, the, the TV company uh, NBC Universal approached me to make the comic, so I did. There you go. There's nothing much more to say about it, really. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't exactly some grand journey, some great inspirational moment where someone came down from the heaven and said... Neil, you are the one. You must write the Lucky Man comic. It was much more mundane than that. And uh, so it was, it was a TV show featuring uh, James Nesbitt, isn't it? The my yes. Stan Lee, who makes a random out of nowhere cameo that doesn't really tie into anything in the pilot. Like out of all the Stanley cameos, that's the one that has the least reason for being. <laughs> Well, actually, it's funny. So that's uh, James Nesbitt walks past Forbidden Planet in London and he looks in the window and he sees Stan Lee signing some comic books. That was his cameo. But he was actually, that was actually filmed in L.A. Oh, oh right. So James ne was James Nesbitt in, it was in, in London? London. It was, he's in London. But when it cuts to Stan Lee being in the comic shop, that's in L.A. Convenient. Why not? Why? Sh it, I, don't ship Stan Lee all the way down to London for just like a 15 second bit of screen time. Yeah. That's yeah I, and I didn't even realise myself. And I've been to, I don't know how many times I've been to that shop. So, yeah, they did a good job. Yeah, absolutely. And it's about this guy, James Nesbitt, who gets this bracelet, is it magic? Who knows? That makes him incredibly lucky or incredibly unlucky. Oh, there's all sorts of stuff going on. And I like that because I, I really enjoy the concept of probability. And I really like the idea of uh, manipulating probability this is why I kind of like the character of Longshot from the X-Men. And I, I think that lends itself to a lot of uh, really interesting scenarios, as we have seen in the more recent Deadpool 2 with Domino. Hmm. Yes, Stanley was asked what his favourite superpower would be, and he said luck. Because yeah. so much about how we live our lives is determined by like We think uh, we have a very you know strong internal locus of control, but actually so much of it is down to just random chance. A great example of this is um, second year of university. I was doing a, um, a, a theatre unit module thing, uh, and one of the people in that 
unit was me was who I got to know quite well through that was this guy called uh, Howie. And uh, then summer came along and uh, my family and I, we went to Croatia and we um, we did a thing where we did uh, like a week in a villa and a week sailing. And one of the times we went sailing, we went to this place, I can't remember what it was called. And I want to say Korchula? I, don't, I can't remember. And uh, we had to go, we went there on one specific day and we went, um, we had to get another boat. We docked there and we had to get another boat to this other island thing. And there were boats going out at several different times a day. And uh, we got into one of the ferry things, little ferry boat things, turned around, and there was Howie. We had both gone to the exact same place at the exact same time. And if I, we had waited for a boat, like, five minutes, if not even that, I never would have even known he would have been there. It, coincidence and random chance, it's, it can create such bizarre scenarios. Hmm. Yeah, I know. It, that was a really weird. boring anecdote. Now that I'm thinking about it, <laughs> I met a guy from my university in a place that wasn't my university. Oh, isn't life strange? What a small world! I don't know what to say to that. You, you can agree. You can agree. Yes, that was boring. You could have picked a much more interesting thing. Yeah. Oh, oh no, no! Here's an even better thing: the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. Because the guy who did that originally, whose name I did learn, Gavrov Princeship or whatever his name was. Um, he initially I tried to... Get the concept. I think we get the concept. Yeah, we get the concept. <laughs> they missed him. He then found him again after coming to the savage shop. Shot him. World War One. You know, interconnected. The trousers of time. Anyway. And it, it makes for some very interesting stories. Um, yes, it does. It does. And one of the stories it did in the, uh, the Lucky Man comic that I read... I think he was sort of going, it was going from different from the TV series, in because I haven't seen a lot of the TV series. Was it, uh, it was looking into the history of the bracelet thing, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, that's exactly right. It, so it's, where did the bracelet actually come from? How did it get its powers? Uh, what does it actually do? And so it's all flashbacks as to what the bracelet does, and it goes in reverse chronology. So the most recent story and going back, where is it cropped up in history? Oh, I see that's, I, I see, I, I like that concept as well, because, Again, this whole thing passing from person to person, like the mask or like, I don't know, the golden turd from American Dad. <laughs> I don't know. It's, 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 in, it's an interesting concept. Oh, uh, I, I kind of see, see it explored a bit more than the TV series, which I didn't really gel to, if I'm honest. That's right. You, you can't like everything. No, I, I try. I try, but I can't. I can't. And some things I don't try. Some things I don't want to like. I'm looking at you, DC! Really need to move away. That I have a problem. I have a big, big problem. Now, uh, one thing I do want to talk about is, um, so in the past we have plugged the T Purple Learn How to Make Comics webinar. That's sort of coming back, isn't it? Yeah, we got a, uh, this film crew called Manatee who liked it. They're actually going to film me properly rather than me just filming it myself. And so they filmed the first three webinars. I've got three more to film, uh, which is happening, I think. Actually, I think it could be this week or next week, and then the the, the thing is, is relaunched because you got a, a lot of good stuff from the first uh, run of it, and some of the students who did it are now publishing their work. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose I should explain what this is, really, shouldn't I? Yeah, um, just to start off with, yeah, just give the cap <laughs> give the capers a brief overview. We have talked about it on the show before, so some of them may get the general idea, but just in case there's anything so, new okay, you want to talk basically, about, basically, okay. Thing ever made comic wise and i learned a lot from making it a lot, a lot of mistakes and I'm, I'm very my background is engineering and i've um I've got a very systematic scientific approach to comics and I, I don't believe in being able to paint by numbers but i believe there is a formula and a pattern for good products so for example if you have a restaurant uh, you need to have uh great food uh, great location great presentation uh great weight stuff uh and if your food is no good, people won't come. If the prices aren't right, if it's dirty there, if the people are rude, they're all formulas for disaster. Even if you get them all right, it doesn't guarantee success, but it greatly increases your chances. Kind of like a checklist rather than a guarantee, if that makes sense. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Because, again, it's no... Um... It's no one specific aspect. It goes with, same with comics. You've got the writing, you've got page layout, artistry, uh, lettering, all, and then the story itself and the character itself. And no, 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 it's all so, all these little things. It's like we imagine these comics or films or TV shows as just one big thing with the finished product because that's what we get it to. We get it to as one big thing. But it's more like, 
I don't know, it's, like it's sediment. Made up of consti- yeah, it's made up of constituent parts. And you can break it any way you like. And I, to me, I break it down into six areas. You've got the premise, you've got the writing, you've got the art, you've got the coloring, you've got the lettering, you've got the editing. And if you just take writing alone, there's um, five elements to me for that. You've got your dialogue, your plot, your characters, your universe, and your storytelling. And I explain this, I'll do this very quickly, but if you imagine watching TV in a hotel room as you're flicking through the channels, ignoring the visuals, because this is just about story, Mm -hmm. if the dialogue is boring or stupid, you'll change channel. Mm. What keeps you watching a bit longer is the plot. Does this interest you? Do you want to find out what happens next? Is it surprising? And and the plot is slash plot slash genre. Because if it's an action film, you you want, or if it's science fiction, maybe you're just interested in that genre. So you want to see that. Um, what gets you coming back week after week, though, is the characters, because you care about them, you want to find out what happens to them, or you hate them. And what gets people dressed up as, uh, as stormtroopers or the Night's Watch is the universe. So people just love the universe that's created, be it Star Trek, be it uh, Avatar, be it um, Marvel Universe, everything connects together. People just fall in love with the universe or something, uh, and what it's like to be in that world. But even if you have, even if you have all those together, it, it's like having the best joke in the world. You need to know how to tell it, and that's storytelling. And so... The writing side alone is broken up into five elements, and even those I can subdivide further if necessary to explain what I'm... And the reason I built these models is because I'm going to give feedback to people. I, saying I don't like this isn't good enough. You have to explain what you don't like and why. That's not Which criticism, I, that's an opinion. That's two very different things. Uh, well, I, I think it's, it's feedback. Yeah. Because I believe in Venn diagrams, in the creator's uh, vision and the editor's vision. And I will never publish anything I'm not proud of. But similarly, the creator should never make a change they don't want to make. There should always be a room in the middle. But if you're going to point out what the flaw is, you have to explain what's wrong. And you say, for example, this character, I don't believe the motivation. Hmm. Or you say, you've, okay, you've, so you've set this in the Wild West, but you're not making use of the universe at all. Yeah, so, so, that, so, that's, so that's what you, what you provide. So, so I, I, sorry, I get so passionate about this, I get excited, I go into too much detail. I wouldn't uh, know what that's like. <laughs> um, so what the course does is I go into, I, I, the first webinar is totally free. I go into all the, uh, an overview of these six elements and what you need to do to make comics. After that, which is totally free, you should, be, you should have enough knowledge and material to get started and to get your own comic made. And that's my goal with it, because it's free, get your comic made. If you get enormous value from this and you learn a lot and actually think you can do, you know, want to learn more, then I have the, you can buy the full course and it goes into a deep dive into all those six areas and you get a lot of bonus material as well as templates and, and legal documents and stuff from me. So you don't do what I did, Capers. Don't go and get a master's degree to learn how to write comics. Do what, do what Neil's offering. Yeah, you don't need, yeah, exactly. It's, it's like people who are waiting to find the be, buy the best uh, weight loss equipment and find the perfect personal trainer. Just start, start running, do something. And you can get, you can refine yourself later, but see what the results are at the start. You, you know, it may not be for you. You may not like comics after all, but if you get started, you can at least get something made, and that's what I'm all about. Yeah, and, uh, and hopefully this will, as you say, it's leading to people starting publishing their own work. And how's that been working out for them? Uh, I, I, you can ask any of our alums. I, I think they're delighted with the results. Good. Well, that good. You got some good, satisfied customers. So, is that uh, coming out right now? When's it coming out? Uh, it should be out within the next month or so. Um, when it is out, I'll give you guys another link as well. So there'll be a discount to anyone who gets it from Pod Capers or from Place to Hang a Cape. You hear that, Capers? It's going to be a great deal for you. I'm just spoiling you today, aren't I? And does it have any particular name or is it the catchy things? So we can give you a soundbite. Uh, it's just called How to Make Comics the Teapub Way. But uh, uh, if you can come up with a better soundbite, I'm, I'm all ears. I don't think that kind. I think that kind of works. It's like how to make comics the Marvel way. Now you've got the Tea Pub way. Exactly. Yeah, it, it works, and I, I I know this because you know I had how to draw comics the Marvel way when I was a kid, and it didn't really work for me. And that's because capers. I am terrible at drawing. I'm really really bad. You've no idea. Barely can even do even do stick figures, and that that's great that I got that book when I did because I might have you know in my love of comics had gone on a course or something or got a degree in trying to draw, and I found out that I couldn't have. So because I got that little that book and I got learn I learned something about myself. And I realized, okay, this isn't for me. And meanwhile, I have got I got books like from Robert McKee and Sid Field about how to actually write scripts. I actually oh actually you know what I can do this sort of thing. And this is the great thing. You, it's partially introductory, but also 
a deeper exploration of what not what these things are in terms of theory or stuff, but necessarily how they work. Hmm. Hmm. Great. Well, brilliant. That's, that's, that sounds great. We wait that with bated breath, like we await the future titles coming out of T Pub. Give us a little bit of sneak peek, please. Um, we have Disposable Legends, which is in stores right now. That's written by Terry Mayer. Um, a great fun working with him. So what my, what my actual value add to him was helping him with his pitches. So he, had, he comes up with these great concepts for, for stories, but he can't pitch them very well. So I just refine him into what, what is he actually like, this concept? What, what's cool about it? So he says it in one or two sentences. So mm. Disposable Legends is set in the future where cloning is legal. And they recreate clones of famous people from history. Oh, clones! Like, I thought you said crooning. I was just like, well, of course cloning, cloning is legal. Why wouldn't no, crooning, crooning be legal? <laughs> Strangers in the night. Oh, God, I'm, he's, he's crooning. Someone arrest him. No. Um, yeah, they take up famous people from history. So, for example, Muhammad Ali, and they make him fight uh, Bruce Lee. Or um, Attila the Hun versus Genghis Khan. And they fight to the death, and uh, it's the biggest sport in the future. Until, of course, something goes wrong. Of course. Oh, I like that. It's like Clone High, but it's gone terribly, terribly wrong. Uh, that's, that's one title we have coming out. That's currently in stores right now, actually, Disposable Legends, issue one. Um, we have uh, The Traveller, which is our first steampunk comic. It's this guy called Tassos uh, is a friend of mine. He's pioneering a new, new way of making comics using uh, the software called Poser. So you create all the characters and the backgrounds in this 3D model, and then you can r render them in any position you want and any any angle you like. Oh. And then he just goes. So it looks like it's all um, been created, but it's so it's a much faster way of making comics if you have a very long comic because everything's been done al already. Okay, well that sounds interesting. And, yeah, it's it's cool, and, and the company uh, having doing webinars and we're promoting it the, the comic through them is like what you can do using the software. Um, it, it sets uh, this guy. He's the, the opening line is uh, he's writing a diary. And he writes, "Life is shit," and uh, he's basically uh, a miserable uh, sod. Everything's going terrible for him, and he's about to kill himself when this portal opens next to him, and this traveler comes in from another dimension. And not knowing what happens, he panics and shoots the guy and kills him, <laughs> and uh, then runs away. And then he comes back hours later, and his body's there, and he pokes it and takes off the suit the guy's wearing and he puts on this glove the glove because it's cold and the glove clamps onto his arm and he, he, so he screams in pain he hits it and he hits some buttons on the glove and that takes him somewhere I'm not yeah I don't, I'm leaving you that, that's when the story starts oh, oh you are a master at teasing us with your stories <laughs> damn it you, you're a showman you are <laughs> Get Hugh Jackman. You're the greatest showman. Oh, God. <laughs> um, we have a, a new comic out, uh, should be out next year, I think, called The Number Station, um, which is written by Jed McPherson. Uh, he, it's, which, again, I'm, I'm producing for him. It's, it's, the opening scene is really cool. This guy uh, is, it's, it's like, it's in the city of London. There's you know, this banking thing, and he's got this radio that's just shouting these random numbers. And someone just says, can you turn that down? What is that? And the guy is just, is, we look, he's got this complete glazed look in his face. And he reaches into his drawer, pulls out a gun, and then just starts shooting everyone in the whole place. And it's, the, act, the artwork's fantastic for that scene, just you know, shooting everyone. And finally, he accidentally drops the radio, and the radio stops the numbers, and his eyes go back to normal. And he looks around and goes, oh, oh God, what? And then and runs away. Um, that's the opening scene. And what the number station, it's, it's called Transmission, sorry, the story. Uh, and uh, what uh, the numbers mean, what what's happening, is all slowly revealed. Ooh. Oh, God. They've hacked our minds! Illuminati confirmed! Oh, I will not to read it and find out. And finally, the only one, other one I can remember off the top of my head is Transdimensional, written by Michael Gordon, who I believe will be writing Batman within four years. Um, he must he, be stopped. That's, uh, uh, <laughs> he'll do a good job with it, though. Okay, um, and uh, th that's about um, the Soviet submarine which gets discovered. It was lost in the you know, collapse of the Soviet Union, and this guy arranges for crew to go down there to see if they can salvage things. But that's not really why he wants to go down there. And what they find down there is actually not what he was expecting or wants either. They actually found zombie jellyfish. 
worse. Worse than zombie jellyfish? They oh found my a God. whole stack of Podkeeper's recordings. Oh, no. They must be destroyed. <laughs> we have fun on this show. But seriously, if you don't listen to all of our stuff, Capers, you are no fan of ours. And we are very disappointed in you. But what else have you been doing? Um... I, oh, time! I'm doing that with Amrit Birdie. Uh, well, I've got a lot of stuff in the works. I, I hadn't thought about this. Um, uh, yes, so we're doing um, uh, time, which is this guy. It's the year 2000. His um, he's at university. His biggest concerns are sleeping with girls and watching the next episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. In that order. Oh my God! You made uh, a comic about me again. I did indeed. But then what happens is he gets lucky uh, one night with this girl. It's her first time. But then he oh, wakes so it's not up about me then. Wearing, okay. wearing different clothes in a different city uh, in a hotel room. And thoroughly confused, he opens up, uh, he, he sees this letter on the, on the, in the hotel room. He opens it up and it tells him he has an appointment on the 1st of May 2030 at a law firm. And he goes outside and he realizes that it is 2030. The whole world has moved on 30 years except him. Ooh. And then, then the story carries on from there. Oh, God. Oh, oh God. Oh, these, are, these are also really... These, again, it's the thing you talk about premise. These sound like really intriguing premises -ies. Oh, thank you. Um, I've just been handed a note so telling me what other things are working on, which I, so I actually forgot. Um, we're doing... I, I can't mention the name of it yet, but it's uh, two titles that are um, big video game titles. Um making comics for them uh we're also doing uh, one called teachers which is uh a murder mystery set in a school written by an actual teacher and it's from the perspective of the teachers and that what what they're like and the bickering that goes behind the scenes and what it's like to actually be in a, from that, that end of the school because everyone's been a, as a student in the school but they don't know what it's like to be a teacher in a school mm, I, I, I like i like that as well because i'm a lot of educators in my family so it's interesting to get that perspective yeah and uh i think so we are also doing some um uh, i've been ha oh yes you know what i <laughs> just handed me a note to have got more stories i haven't i've forgotten about um we're doing a a charity comic uh for a guy called uh omar uh, samra who's a bit of a legend he's one of only 30 people in history to do the grand slam which is skiing to both poles and climbing the, the top seven highest peaks in the in the world uh he was the youngest ever egyptian uh or, or the first egyptian to climb mount everest and he has this great charity where they take, they take used toys and give them to orphans. Oh, brilliant. And yeah, he's fantastic. So I've written this story for him, which is uh, about a unicorn who's trying to save her, her dad. And it's, um, the theme is the secret to living is giving and how much satisfaction that gives you. And it's, it's a metaphor with animals and everything. And it's, uh, I, I, I think it's a cute, sweet story, but we're doing it for charity. That, that sounds uh, really lovely. Oh, thank you. I, 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 the Omar is an inspiration. He's a great guy. He, he, some of his stories, the things he's done, like he, he, he rode across the Atlantic, him and someone else, to raise money for charity, and then their boat capsized, and it's supposed to be unsinkable. And it wouldn't right itself. So they deployed the uh, emergency life raft, and it didn't inflate, and they were stuck in seven foot, eight foot swells, um, with no knowledge if anyone was coming to get them. It, it, he's done some crazy stuff. Wow. <laughs> um, uh, I've also. If you, if you want to stop me, stop me because I've got uh, three. I more do times. not want to stop you anytime soon. You keep going. Create a new ideas okay. whilst you're here on the show. Come on, let's keep this uh, train uh, rolling. No, I have loads more ideas, but these are the ones that are actually in production. Um, so we've got uh, something called Trickster, which I'm writing with Conor McCreary, um, who wrote uh, Kill Shakespeare. Uh, this is about uh, a leprechaun living in Boston, and he's six foot. He hates the idea that people think leprechauns are short. And obsessed with shoes, someone points out that he's got 300 pairs of sneakers. He says, "Shut up!" Um, and it's I support Nike and Colin Kaepernick. Uh, he's um, if you kind of like imagine Mal from Firefly, uh, he's supposedly in charge of his group of people, but they all bully the hell out of him. And he he goes on a lot of adventures. And what what happens is he's it starts off with just. Some day-to-day -day, you know, shenanigans. He, he's, he can use glamour. He's, when he touches gold, he can create a sort of illusion. And he's doing it to sort of help little people around, like, like a sort of modern-day Robin Hood. But gradually, more creatures from his homeland start appearing in the real world. And he has to banish them and fight them. And like, why are they doing this? Why are more appearing? 
and gradually he finds out why more of them are appearing, and it's revealed what he did to get banished from the homeworld, why he's on Earth. Oh. Um, and finally, I talked about Twisted Fantasy already. That's a spin-off from Twisted Sci-Fi, Twisted Dark. It's the same type of thing. But finally, we have Taste, which is this guy. He's the world's youngest guy to get three Michelin stars. And the opening scene is him uh, walking into his restaurant. And he says, all right, let's do it. And he's smoking a cigarette. And he throws a cigarette away, walks into his restaurant. And the whole staff are there. And they all start clapping and cheering because he's just got his third Michelin star. And he's only 25 or something. And they're all, uh, you know, giving cheers. And he goes, "Thank you, guys. You know, but this is all. This was a team effort. In fact, give yourselves a round of applause. They all start, sh- you know, cheering. And they says, shake the hand of the person next to you. Shake the other hand. They're all doing that. And suddenly, he slams the table loudly. And they all stop and look up. And he goes, "Half the hands you just shook will not be here in three months. You were good enough to get me this far, but I'm going to be the world's first four-star Michelin chef, and I'm willing to sacrifice any of you who are not good enough to help get me there." Oh, shit. Uh, that's the opening scene for that story. Oh, God. This, this is... A, so, oh. Oh. You know when you see something, you hear, or hear something really good and you just don't have any reaction, just like, oh! <laughs> I God, review I have things for myself. a living. <laughs> well, I hope you like these stories. These this sound, this sound so cool. That's, that's, that's like something... Um, Oh, uh, what, what's, what's his face? Uh, not Tarantino. The guy who did uh, Three Billboards and uh, uh, got In Bruges and stuff like that. The guy That sounds like something he would write. That sounds like something really cool. Oh, cool. Thank you. Well, I hope you'll re- review it soon. <laughs> I'm sure someone at a place to hang your cape will get on that. <laughs> David! <laughs> sort that out. <laughs> anyway, he doesn't listen to this show. Let's be honest. Now, nah, of course he does. We love you, David! Dave's the guy. David is a good guy. Yeah, as are you, Neil. And the stuff you do is really, really cool. I've enjoyed hearing about it. But what I want to know is, where are you going to be right now? Where are you going to be in the in the future in terms of comic conventions so people can come up to you and get your stuff? Well, sadly, for the first time since uh, 2012, I'm not going to be at New York Comic Con. Um, I've got some things happening here. But I will be at uh, London MCM and uh, Birmingham. And... Um, I'm sure there are a few others that are on the list. I can't remember where I'm going to right now. But no uh, one handing you a note for that? Come on. Um, I'm at most conventions in the UK. Um, I, pro- I might be at Dublin Comic Con. I'm not entirely sure. But uh, I, I'm apparently at Lakes, yes. Um, it's a well oiled <laughs> machine on your side of Skype, isn't it? I, I'm not in charge of where I go. I go where they tell me to go. You know what? I know how you feel. I'm in pretty much the exact same scenario. I love my benevolent place to hang your cape overlords. I'm just joking. Please don't activate the chip in my brain. <laughs> anyway. You still there? Yeah, I'm still there. Just It was a mild electric shock. Mild electric shock. Well, wherever you go, Neil, I'm sure people will be very delighted to see you and get all of your lovely stuff. But where, if they can't, for whatever reason, go to a con, where can they get your stuff? Well, we recommend first and foremost uh, comic book shops because it supports the community. Uh, fame at local bookshops. Um, uh, if, if you'd like to get it signed by me personally, if you buy it from our website, which is tpubcomics.com, then uh, I'll sign each book that's bought through that um, and get it posted to you. Um, or worst case scenario, you can use Amazon. But we highly recommend local comic shops because it, you know, it's important to support the community. Oh, failing that through our website. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'm sure hearing all this stuff and getting such a small taste of your brilliant stuff that capers out there will be if not willing to then certainly forced to buy your stuff because capers this has the pod capers seal of approval on it for all the tea pubs so go and get it do it i command you it's it's fun to command people it really is and on that note i think we're gonna end the show thank you very much neil for joining me today thanks for having me it's been an absolute pleasure. And if you enjoy the show, Capers, please tell your friends. Shout it from the rooftops! And if you haven't already, go back and listen to some of our other super episodes. Like, for example, when we went to Miyawano Comic Con, and you may have heard Neil speak before. You may we, uh, we, we interviewed you, yeah, didn't we? I honestly can't remember. If, I, if you did, I was traumatised. 
Yeah, probably then. You would probably, you'd probably repress that then, absolutely. And you can listen to the show on iTunes, Podbean, YouTube, Spotify, or at podcapers.com. We have a Patreon. Check out the rewards, patreon.com forward slash ap2hyc. If you want to get in touch with us, suggest show topics, or maybe come on the show yourself, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at ap2hyc, or email us at podcapers at ap2hyc.com. Thank you very much to Dan Harris for our logo, the lovely microphone with the red and blue 3D glasses. Those are mine. And thank you for listening. This has been Podcapers, the official your podcast for a place to hang your cape. Cue the music!